gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the official launch of the European Corporate Governance Research Foundation that we are <coughs> holding today here in beautiful Brussels on a wonderful strike day. I welcome all those who made it despite the adverse circumstances. And it seems like always in Brussels, the circumstances are not that as adverse as they are being shown on TV. Things seem to work. Thanks for all of you who made it here. It's a great pleasure to uh, start this event with my thanks to the two founding patrons of our foundation, to Karl Henrik Svanberg, the chairman of BP, and to Jacob Jakob Weinberg, <laughs> the chairman of Investor. The uh, European Corporate Governance Research Foundation would not have existed, and it has existed now for more than two years, uh, without the initiative of the two of you in particular, and all the people helping us to establish this contact between the academic world and the corporate world that is the hallmark of the European Corporate Governance Institute and the Associated Research Foundation. I am Arthur de Contan, the chairman of the European Corporate Governance Research Foundation, and I have been involved in the issue of corporate governance research in Europe for many, many years. I remember those days in the 90s when uh, we were having these workshops, these conferences, these networks, all on a voluntary basis driven by all the exciting questions that corporate governance was posing at the time. And corporate governance is one of these issues that seems to be like good wine, getting better the older it gets. So you leave it and discuss it and think about it, and you see that it pertains to much more than the narrow meaning of the word may in fact suggest. So in the end, the European Corporate Governance Institute was founded in 2002, largely thanks to the initiative of Marco Beck and Leo, uh, and Leo Goldschmidt, who are both here. I'm very happy in particular that Leo is here, uh, who has been a driving force behind this teaming up of academic and corporate interests in one of the key questions, I think, of our times. Uh, we tend to forget that corporations are the backbone of our modern society, um, despite all the politicians' claim to their own importance, which is certainly true, but uh, in the end, firms are the ones who are providing and generating the wealth we are living from. Governing corporations, governing the interplay between corporations, governing markets, that's what we need to think about. That's what corporate governance research is about. And the European Corporate Governance Institute has developed very, very strongly in the last 15 years, 16, 14 years, sorry, 14 years. And um, out of this growth of the ideas and the research strengths of the institute that covered many interesting fields of research and many researchers across Europe in the uh, fields of finance, economics, management, law, and related areas, has grown this feeling that we need to have stronger support, that we need to get a more structured and broader support to conduct all these activities of which we're going to talk a little bit later today. Thanks to the founding patrons, we have been able in 2013 to set up this foundation, and thanks to the initiative of all those involved, we are able to today open this formal event. Give me great pleasure to announce Pavel Sviboda from the European Commission, who is addressing a few introductory remarks to the meeting today, and we will then move on to our keynote speaker, Professor Bengt Holmström from MIT, who has kindly agreed to join us today to share his views and insights about corporate governance. I'll have a few words to say to introduce Bengt Holmström later. So let me turn over the floor without much ado to Pavel Svivoda. Thank you for joining us today. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. And I have to say I'm, I'm truly delighted to, to take part in, in the launch of uh, the European Corporate Governance uh, Research uh, Foundation. And uh, on behalf of uh, many colleagues uh, in the European Commission and myself, I have to say we, we welcome wholeheartedly uh, the creation of this uh, foundation. And we will want to draw on your uh, resources uh, in, in the future, your expertise and your, and your wisdom. Um, I think you are joining uh, a, a rich family of European uh, foundations which uh, focus on uh, um, research uh, and, uh, and innovation. They cover almost all spheres of, uh, of life uh, from uh, education onto environment. There are in fact 113 and 14,000 uh, public benefit foundations in Europe. And I think they make, they make a tremendous uh, impact uh, at, at different levels, be it European, be it, be it uh, national or, or regional. And they also contribute to, um, to funding research quite sizably. Uh, it is estimated that uh, research foundations contribute annually 5 billion euro, which is about half of what, uh, what we spent in Horizon 2020 um, a year. Uh, to support European research and, uh, and, and innovation. So it is, it is a sizable um, amount and, and foundations are, are really a key actor uh, in that uh, landscape. Uh, let me say a few words ab about uh, the centrality of corporate governance, which is your, uh, which is your main uh, theme, because uh, as our chairman has said, it's, uh, it's the case that um, corporate governance is like good wine, but I think there is a reason for it. Uh, I think there is a reason which uh, doesn't necessarily concern the wine itself so much as uh, the, the way our society and economy is, uh, is, is changing. Uh, I think the economic exchange is clearly becoming more um, hyper-connected. It's becoming more flexible, interactive. It's not only about the rise of platforms or, or a collaborative economy. I think we see this phenomenon being expressed in different, uh, even traditional fields of economic activity. Huh? We have this uh, uh, integration of the product and service markets, uh, for, for example, which is, I think, one of the defining uh, features of how the new economy uh, shapes up. And, uh, and corporate governance uh, needs to respond to, to this uh, phenomenon quite profoundly. Uh, secondly, we have, we have a glowing, growing uh, global competition um, and, and there what we see is that after uh, the low-hanging fruits uh, are collected, uh, many economies, many countries uh, resort uh, to other measures. They, uh, they, resort, uh, they resort, they try to gain competitive uh, edge uh, by uh, the way that which, uh, in which the companies are run. So what it means for us, I think, is that we need to stick even more firmly to uh, our high standards of transparency and uh, accountability. We can only level up. I think uh, Europe is, uh, is almost structurally incapable of leveling down happily. Uh, and that's, I think, very good news for us uh, in the future as long as we keep up uh, uh, the standards that we, we believe in. Uh, thirdly, uh, we clearly need to rejuvenate uh, the social contract. And again, so, uh, corporate uh, governance issues are, are at the heart of this, uh, uh, this debate. So we need to face the challenge of growing inequality because it will not uh, solve itself. It will need to be addressed. Um, problems with social mobility similarly will not, uh, will not be solved by, by themselves. Um, so the way we allocate resources, uh, the way we empower people, this is all that, uh, that is very much uh, part and parcel of corporate governance uh, uh, debates. And fourthly and lastly, um, I see the demands of, uh, of sustainability as one of the trademarks of the 21st uh, century. I mean, just, just imagine uh, when we grow by 2.5 additional billion people by 2050, we'll be almost 10 billion people on the planet using the same res resources, but also having the same aspirations. I think that's, that is what, is what has changed in the, in the past two decades. In the past two, two, two decades ago, people in developing countries were, were, broadly speaking, a lot of the times happy with what they had. Uh, but with the arrival of the smartphone, with the arrival of social media, they've started to understand that there is a better life out there. And uh, they now uh, aspire to similar standard of living that, uh, that we have uh, without obviously the, this being possible in a short period of time. 
so that's, that's another issue that we need to address and sustainable finance in particular, I think is, uh, uh, needs to provide, uh, provide answers. So all these issues I, I think concern uh, the way in which the firm, the company uh, functions within, uh, within the society uh, at large and these uh, interrelationships will be of, uh, of formative uh, nature. So I've said, I've said a, few, a few words about why I think uh, central, uh, uh, corporate governance will be of central importance. Let me say very briefly uh, on what I think will be on top of its agenda. And of course, uh, these will uh, be issues of economic growth, but probably the emphasis will shift in the next period from, uh, from micro to, uh, to micro. We have, we have been for years now in, in a crisis mode, which is conducive to focusing attention on, on the micro level, but we need to uh, recalibrate that and we need to understand better uh, the, the micro dynamics in Europe. And I say understand better because very often we don't really know what is going on. A lot of the times our statistical systems are, are not geared towards uh, uh, uncovering what is really going on at the, uh, in, in the economy at large. We're trying to catch up and some member states, Italy for example, are introducing this micro level evaluation a technique which uh, I think is very revealing because what it shows is that we have islands of growth uh, in Europe. We have uh, these small pockets of highly productive uh, firms uh, and we have the huge majority of firms which are underperforming. Uh, and this is again a challenge for corporate governance issues because we need to create ways to allocate resources better so that uh, these highly productive firms uh, have the right conditions to grow uh, but that we also help the others to, to level up. Uh, secondly, and this will be my, my uh, last food for thought at this, uh, at this point, uh, uh, corporate governance can be transformative uh, and, and we need uh, uh, corporate governance to be transformative in many areas. Uh, and let me, let me pick up innovation as the, as the one where uh, it has a particular role to, uh, to play. Um, I think in Europe in particular we need to be much uh, strongly geared towards uh, experimentation. And, uh, and the culture of risk taking. Um, I was at the uh, Smart uh, Cities uh, annual assembly last week in Eindhoven and someone said that a smart city should be like a startup. Namely, it should embrace uh, risk and manage to control it better through means such as collaboration and, and, and partnership. And I think that's, that's exactly the case, that we need uh, not just smart cities, but we need uh, uh, many uh, other agents to be, to be like uh, uh, smart, smart, uh, to be like startups. Um, finally, let me um, say about what, how we see um, your activities um, fr from the point of view of the European Commission. Uh, and of course we are right now in the midst of a, a big uh, change in our modus operandi when it comes to the better regulation agenda. Um, and, um, and I think uh, it is a genuine uh, change. Uh, one could even say it's a revolution in the way that regulation is being done because what we are aiming at is, uh, is for stakeholders to be involved in formulating uh, new principles from the point of inception of policy. I think that's, uh, that's pretty radical. Uh, uh, I think that is as inclusive as you can get. Uh, and I hope that many member states will, will, follow, will follow suit. So there is a new way in which um, uh, regulation is, is being done and corporate, government uh, comp corporate governance touches uh, on the work of, uh, of several of the commission departments from the legal framework of corporations and gender equality in DG justice through bank uh, governance, supervision and resolution, capital markets union, pensions and pension funds in DG FISMA, entrepreneurship in DG Grow and, uh, and so on. Uh, and there are also horizontal issues, uh, of course, that are extremely important. So, but I think if you ask me where, where the leadership for corporate governance lies in, uh, in, uh, in the Commission at the moment, I think it's, there is multiple um, leadership uh, because uh, this uh, Commission is pretty much about overcoming uh, barriers, about overcoming divisions, about working more in the cross-sectoral, cross-disciplinary uh, fashion. I think that's the right way to, to proceed. I think this is what uh, reflects better uh, the world uh, outside. Uh, and even though it might have been easier for some of you to have a single uh, point of contact in the European Commission, we, uh, we shouldn't go down that route because we need uh, leadership that comes from different sources. Uh, it's almost like Chairman Mao dreaming about uh, 100 flowers uh, uh, blossoming. I think that's uh, the situation right now. I think that's how we should operate. 
uh, for, uh, for, the, for uh, mutual benefits. Uh, but speaking of 100 flowers, we have one flower today that needs to blossom, and that's the European Corporate uh, Governance Research Foundation. Uh, let me say once more that we are extremely uh, happy about uh, today's uh, launch, uh, that our door is open, uh, and that we look forward to uh, working uh, together on uh, what is uh, uh, going to be a good and ever better wine. Thank you very much, German, for, for inviting me today. Thank you, Pavel Pibura. It was uh, a lot of food for thought. Corporate governance is transformative, as you said. We come back to that today several times. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Bengt Holmström from MIT, who has, in fact, been involved with the European Corporate Governance Institute for many years. He's a fellow of the ECGI and uh, has been actively involved in its activities for more than 20 years. Bengt Holmström is the Paul A. Samuelson Professor of Economics at MIT and probably one of the most influential economists of our times. Those of you who have studied economics have been exposed to his thinking in areas from organizational theory to finance, management theory, game theory, and many other areas. Those who haven't studied economics have probably also been exposed to his thinking, not quite knowing why, but uh, his influence is in fact maybe becoming more visible the more time is passing. So it's a great honor and a great pleasure to introduce Bengt Holmström, who is also quite knowledgeable about corporate governance by personal experience. He's one of the academics who is bridging the divide between academic research and corporate practice in an admirable way. And uh, his talk about corporate governance today is probably also influenced by his own experience. Bengt, you have the floor. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Elu, and uh, thank you all for of ECGI and ECGRF. I have to practice it a little bit. Uh, it's such a complicated acronym. Um, for uh, inviting me to come and, and present some thoughts on, on, on corporate governance. Uh, 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 I should say that uh, I, I, I was here from the beginning. We, we were some, I don't remember, 15 or 16 founding researchers uh, in the beginning, when, and, and never did I uh, imagine it would uh, do as well as it did, and I think this has a lot to do with, uh, as Elu said, uh, with uh, uh, Neil Goldsmith and uh, Mark Beer, who were, uh, were here in the beginning. Uh, I have, uh, as a, you know, I had to give you a topic, or I have to give a topic, how fi have firms become too transparent, I think it's a subject I gave. I, I'm, I'm already regretting that I would have wished it would be a little more opaque then <laughs> uh, which fits my theme, you know, uh, don't be too transparent. Uh, the, uh, but I, I'm taking it uh, as, a, as, a, as part of this general conversation we are going to have here. We have, you know, uh, Carl Hendrix Wambay, Jakob Wambay, I mean, uh, unbeatable uh, experience with regard to uh, corporate governance in practice. Uh, so uh, I will be very interested in hearing uh, how they say. I am going to approach it uh, less perhaps from a, a, a sort of economic standpoint uh, and, and more from, a, from the point of view of, of, of my experience. I was 13 years on the board of Nokia, 19 years on a family business board, and, and I've been on a, some other boards as well. And um, I'm, I'm going to try to bridge, you know, the gap uh, between these two. But uh, but they are thoughts of, a, of, let's say, an economist who have, have thought about the topic, but then seen uh, what the practice looks like. And uh, I think there is a gap to be bridged uh, in 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 that respect. Uh, the corporate governance we should understand uh, has not been. I mean. 
In 1998, I gave a talk in Finland on corporate governance. I, well, I was invited to give a lecture, and I, uh, I said I want to talk about corporate governance, and they sort of almost uninvited me because they thought that they had no idea what it was about. So that's how young, in some sense, the field is, and and uh, and uh, and it has come a long way. The 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 things that have really speeded up things, if one puts it that way, are unfortunately the scandals, you know, for the first scandals, uh, the Enron scandals and WorldCom and so on in the early 2000s, and then, of course, now the financial crisis. Those are big drivers for the discussion, uh, both in public and in private, about corporate uh, governance, and, and has led, of course, to major, major uh, research uh, initiatives. Corporate governance, uh, it may be the biggest topic people are writing on in economics, strangely. If I look at the SSRM, which is kind of where people publish their working papers, I, I bet corporate governance is the most, uh, the biggest of all, uh, which is uh, somewhat surprising, but uh, shows you how interested, how much interest there is. Uh, my concern, the title uh, that, uh, 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 the reason I gave this title is I have uh, some concern about what is happening and, 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 and the advice that people are given in, in response to these scandals. The scandals had, they were, they was obviously important to react to the scandals. You know, uh, there was no time to start studying things. You had to, the politicians had to do something and regulators had to do something and so on. Uh, one of the issues they fo they focus on several issues, but uh, they try to rein in, you know, the 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 whether those were bankers or, or, or corporate executives, those were the ones that were thought to be the culprits, and uh, and uh, and the regulations were uh, designed to rein them in in some manner or another, and so the focus was very much on you know something somebody did something wrong, and this there was some misconduct. Whereas an economist might think the system had some problem. It wasn't that, you know, there were individuals that did things wrong necessarily, but the system somehow wasn't designed correctly. And uh, I'm mo much more in that camp of thinking, you know, that if the airplane comes down, my first thought isn't that, you know, oh, the captain just died down. You know, I'm thinking maybe there was something problem with the engine or something like that. You notice how they study these things. The last resort is to say actually there was human error. Or, or something like that. They don't jump to the conclusion right away that there was, uh, uh, no, not even to terrorists, you know, would be, uh, be would, I'm not implying that CEOs are terrorists, but you know, they are sort of the, <laughs> 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 they, are, they are not uh, always very popular in, in, in the economic uh, circles when it comes, when things like this happen. So uh, there, I want to, uh, that's where I'm coming from. I'm going to try to explain that this sort of knee-jerk reaction to more transparency, which you overwhelmingly saw, incidentally, in the, in the uh, financial crisis. I mean, obviously, the trans lack of transparency, and nobody knew what was going on. Wall Street had no clue of what they were trading. Obviously, that was the cause of this, part of the cause of this crisis. Uh, I have spent the last eight years saying that I think that's wrong, but I won't talk about it right now. That, 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 that this sort of lack of transparency in these debt instruments is, is, a, is a logical, rational, and functional uh, part of, of, the, of the system of, of debt. But it just shows you, the same applies to, to, I'm going to use that same argument, or I'm going to take that line of argument uh, today and argue for basically reasons why you know, some maximum transparency actually is not desirable uh, socially, and, and why, why this uh, knee-jerk reaction needs to be uh, supported by, by more and more careful uh, re research. I should say that uh, behind, when I listened to your comments, I thought about, you know, one could have also talked to, I, I think corporate governance is, is, is confronting very big and complicated uh, changes because I think they, uh, the, the, the corporations are going to have to change with the technology. How soon it will happen, but uh, I don't know. But, uh, you know, as the, it looks now, there is a new element in the game, 
that I don't have very much to say about, but I want to raise as an issue, is the involvement of the public. You know, they, this is, this is uh, and, and, and one, if I want to put it very starkly, this, you know, uh, in a, some ways it is an attack on the time-modern notion of representative governance. You know, this idea that you, you don't know very much, but you choose somebody who will know or already know something more than you do and therefore represents you. Yeah, and uh, such as the corporate board or such as the politicians and so on. We are in, you just look at the elections in the US, you see that we are in some kind of a world where you know everybody feels like he or she can say anything about anybody. And, and, and this mass of opinion and, and sort of unstructured opinion and, and in the middle of a very transparent internet uh, is really going to have a big impact, I think, on, on corporate governance. But I can't tell you, and I don't want to speculate too much of what it will be, but I just want to say that that's a, this whole thing in that sense will possibly uh, change. But uh, uh, so let me, let me just say that, get then on my plan is to talk a little bit about the, about the, the, the role of corporate governance, uh, corporate transparency, and the cost of the transparency, because it seems clear that everybody believes there are some benefits to the transparency. If you look at uh, the accounting literature, if you look at the finance literature, you see that there are many reasons to be transparent of things so that we can get price discovery, so that we can get information into the stock prices that are value for allocating, uh, allocating capital, for pricing risk, for, for um, you know, also have market uh, discipline on management. But there's, uh, even there, I could talk about some restrictions. I don't think that's unconditional either. But what interests me more in this context is, uh, is uh, that, you know, what are the potential costs of, of, uh, of transparency? And uh, for that, I think, it, I, I think it's important to first understand there are two tasks, you know, if one asks what are the corporate, what are the two big tasks in corporate governance, at least from the economic point of view. There are really two things. One can be expressed in the words of Warren Buffett when he was asked, you know, what do you exactly do with Berkshire Hathaway? What is your job? What do you see yourself in the business of doing? He said, oh, not, actually, I, not that much, you know. And then he paused a little bit. He's a good actor, you know, and he said, well, I, I decide who decides, he said. That's all I'm doing. Well, in, uh, what I'm going to argue basically, that's everything. You know, he's in his typical kind of modesty, he says that's all he's doing. He was actually saying that's, the, that, that's really the only thing that matters. Because believe me, Warren Buffett does not leave things that are very important uh, in a way that he doesn't get involved in in one manner or not. So the first task of corporate governance or the issue that faces people are thinking how should corporations be operating is to figure out ways of how do we decide who should be in charge. That is who, who should be the CEO and the CEO has to pick you know, who should be. So this selection or, or, or choice of person is I would prime and center in the whole thing. Contrast that with the, with, with the focus of the criticism of corporate governance in the press and among economists and so on, which is all about how they conducted themselves badly, these CEOs. It's all about conduct that they were, we call it moral hazard, we use the word moral hazard to describe it in economics, but it's all about conduct, not about the choice of the person or that and the whole transparency discussion therefore becomes very simple. Of course, if, if it is about founding crooks, you know, then transparency tends to be a fairly obvious conclusion or a reasonable conclusion, though not an entirely clear conclusion as you, you, as you will see later. So the second task is, there is a second task, which is how are those in charge to be incentivized to do the right things? But what I'm asserting, at least with my experience, and I will certainly want to hear what, what, what more experienced people say, is that this, in a certain sense, is still second order to the question about, you know, how do you manage having the right people and having them selected 
and deciding when they should step down, deciding who should choose, you should choose next. That triggers, I will argue, a whole set of activities on the board that is, in my experience, the main part of being on the board. That's going to, this is the main theme that I'm going to, I'm going to sort of try to, try to bring, bring, bring forward. And, uh, and so the board's task is not so much or at all to, to sort of sit there and ex you know, figure out whether, whether the CEO and his lieutenants you know, is doing some things right or has some schemes that they are playing or something like that. I think anybody who has been on the board realizes very quickly that you, know, you just don't walk into the boardroom with the mindset of I'm going to sit here and figure out whether they are doing something shady. Uh, you know, you are not just not going to be on the board. You don't want to be on the board. You are not going to be liked to be on the board. Uh, this is not what, uh, what uh, you are doing. As I said, 19 years on the family business, never thought about it. 13 years on the Nokia board, uh, not, never thought. Doesn't mean that sometimes something doesn't pop up that makes you wonder. But it is not, you know, the main task. We are not there to check people. And, and, and what they are doing. So we are there to evaluate, and this is a key part of the story. So what are we doing there? The longer I was on these boards, the longer I understood myself to trying to figure out, you know, what Carl Hendricks, say I would have been on, on the board of er Ericsson, you know, what, how does Carl Hendricks think about running the company? And why is he doing so? When Things were presented, you know, it wasn't just saying, okay, so, I, so we are doing that, or it wasn't just narrowly about strategy of one sort or another. It was what goes through his mind, how does he think about his people, how does he think about whole enterprise, and why is he thinking that way? And all the questions that I asked, and I, as an academic, you usually ask a fair, fair number of questions, you can ask all Ola, you know, they were always basically addressed to this question. Sometimes I thought I knew the answer, but I still asked because I wanted to hear the answer from the others. So if you put yourself in that mindset about trying to figure out this, it is actually very much like an academic listens to seminars, trying to figure out, you know, why is Elu, you know, what is the model he's building, why is he thinking, why is he, is he so as to be able to evaluate, do I believe in this model, do I believe in the way the CEO runs this company, that's one very important aspect. Even more important, or just as important, when trouble comes, and trouble always comes, I am not being caught by surprise, necessarily, because I am now in a much better position to say, well, this happened. He had said that this, you know, I know how this team thinks. I can see why it happened. And then I can make a judgment somewhat better whether I will be whether this team will be actually able to get out of this trouble or whether or not. It's very much, I, you are not baseball players, I assume, but baseball has a very interesting dynamic, which is there's a pitcher, it's sort of, it is the CEO. He's the key player on the team, really. And there's always the decision, when do you pull the pitcher? Because his arm gets, you know, thrown, and he throws balls that are, you know, go all ways and so on. And as a spectator, when you start watching this game, you just wonder, why is, the, why is the manager not pulling the guy? Because he obviously, you know, he said it's the first inning or second inning, and the guy hasn't thrown a sensible-looking ball once. Let me tell you, the longer one watches baseball, the longer one understands the obvious. The manager knows what he's doing. Because he knows that he, he goes there, he's looked, he knows his man, and he knows that this can happen, and he understands how his mind works. And then they walk up, by the way, and look them in the eye, and they sort of read, a, a, a picture never walks away uh, alone. So this gives, this is an important part, a prelude to the discussion about transparency, because this is the task that, that, that is important. Why is it a prelude to the transparency? Because I need to get the information from, I can't just read books in order to know what Carl Henrik thinks about. I need to have a, you know, be able to be on terms with him and converse with him. 
and understand how he thinks. If I start go walking in and questioning everything, I can ask questions. Why are you doing that? I can be critical and say, you know, I think, you know, I'm an economist. I think this is not the sensible. How do you thought about this? I, all sorts of sort of, this is not being soft. But I can't continuously question and say, well, I don't believe this. I don't believe that. And, you know, just sort of keep and, and, and kind of irritate it. Any more than you could do it in a seminar in, in, in research. So uh, it's that tacit information, as one can call it, that is so invaluable for the hard decisions you have to make when you get to difficult times. And why not also when you get into, you know, merger and acquisitions and other such times, that you need uh, this, uh, this sort of relationship and that takes time to develop and takes time to re re refine. So that's how I see uh, uh, the, the... So then the comes the question about about transparency. So how does it play a role? Well, because the transparency, this, this is a big investment. Once you have sat there for three, four years, you start to really understand what's going on, how the mind works, and so on, and of course, strategy and such. This is a big investment. Now, what is happening or happened after the scandals, it was sort of like throwing, you know, kind of, the boards were really responsible, but the public and the politicians and, all, uh, and other people kind of just were ready to kind of ditch all this represent this valuable information in favor of opinions about how these were, you know, plots that people had uh, conducted that were, uh, were uh, how devious they had been and, 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 and how badly they had, had behaved. So uh, that's one of the issues that I think we are still rebuilding, this trust in this representative uh, body called the board. And, uh, and uh, it will take time, and maybe then eventually we'll get some other technology, or you know, the internet will kill the whole thing and, and get rid of this representative government. But that's, that's, to me, a very important task. So why is it that uh, transparency is, uh, uh, what is the cost of transparency? Why don't we just you know, give out, the, well, there are the trivial costs, the competitors will see something. That's, that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the fact that given the task, given that the CEO knows that the board members, at least several of the board members, is sort of trying to assess and evaluate how he thinks and how he does his thing and so on, and given that he knows that the stock market is watching also intensely at how, he's being, how well he's doing, people at the CEOs are extraordinarily aware of them being evaluated in that sense constantly. That leads to them to be very concerned about their reputation. And that leads them to manage, if one wants to see, say so, the perception that people have about them. There's a lot of good, and for that, you know, the stuff that the people see, the, who, you know, the board members see, and the, and the public sees, and the stock market sees, this information becomes very valuable as an ingredient. And here is the thing that I think economics has kind of educated us on, is that this game, this incentive problem, it leads to an incentive problem, a very paradoxical incentive problem, that the concern for reputation, which you might think is something that will be good, which it is very often, is actually often very bad. It is the source of the incentive problem. That is, people who get, people, CEOs, all of us, when we are managing other people, when we know that we are being evaluated, and we are, by the way, all the time being evaluated. You are evaluating me not right now, so I, I'm giving a different talk than I thought I would give. No, I'm <laughs> I'm, you are being all the time in this stream of evaluation, then you get to, to you know, your, your character, your ability, your, uh, your, your um, uh, work attitude, all those things are being evaluated, you are going to try to manage how they perceive them to be. And that leads occasionally to entirely wrong kinds of decisions. This idea is something that I got actually, I used to work before I became an academic. And one of the things I observed as a, as a, uh, uh, as a uh, assistant to the CFO was that these fellow, he was, watching these people very carefully, you know, the various, the, 
And this was the old days where there were a lot of different factories and they came there and told what they had been doing. He was watching. They, uh, he, I learned that a lot of them, actually, especially young people, were very reluctant to take on risk. That's one of the examples that I, I sort of, it struck me how risk averse the young people tended to be relative to the more senior people. This is a feature that is a very natural outcome of this, that as long as it's the same as, you know, you go to a party, you don't talk right away very loudly and so on. You, you, you sort of hold back because first impressions matter. So this first impressions matter effect is one of the distortions in the behavior of people. Now, it doesn't mean that the COs necessarily, they have other drivers of how, how they get distorted, but they will, for instance, bring in a fairly robust finding is they will tell good news before bad news. Unless they have so much good news, like Warren Buffett, that he sort of stores his good news and saves it so that he can smooth the income over time. So income smoothing is another example of a, of a distortion, if you wish to call it that way, in, in, uh, as a consequence of, of this evaluation. And uh, project choices you are making. You may go for short-term project choices. If you, if they, they, there's both empirical evidence of this and there's, uh, there's uh, theoretical models of this, that if you, if you, this force ma you force firms to disclose more frequently information, they will go and do more short-term projects because they are being evaluated more frequently, they want to look good more frequently. And so these are pretty big. You, you understand that you know, some misconduct or you know, uh, they're, they're bad, bad things these managers may do, but, but uh, if they start to you know, make different kind of investments, they are, they are releasing information in a particular pattern, they are managing the managing the information flow in ways that are, are, are not desirable, that is a very a, a, a higher order cost than uh, most other you know, uh, type of, of uh, misconduct. Hoarding is another example. Uh, and then oftentimes not taking any projects because they feel they are, they, this, this aversion to risk taking is often one that comes from the fact that, uh, that they don't feel they have a fair hearing. And the key is that the people who are evaluating them don't know what the circum they see that they invested, but they don't know what the circumstances under which they invested them. And if you feel that you are just marginal, you know, investing in a marginal project, you are not going to get a fair assessment when the outcome comes. So actually, if you look at this, uh, there's sort of a simple model where you show that you know you never get a fair hearing, because the marginal investment will always get the unfair hearing, because the people will update based on assumption that you saw something on average that was worth investing. But if you just saw the marginal project, you are already behind. So uh, these these ideas and these models, I think, have been important to these reputation concerns. Uh, and and the key to underline here is. Here is transparency, here is concern for reputation, which might be thought of as being valuable traits, actually the very source of the problem. And so what is the role of the board if you look at it from this perspective? Well, the role of the board is to be a filter and taking a longer view and not make continuous judgments even though the flow of information is continuous. Learning, putting your mind through and learning how these people think. They have the the luxury of not having to make decisions all the time about our judgment about what these people are. We all sit there and we, are, we have time to wait and see what happens and learn about it. So in a sense, the board is an information buffer against the brass assessments that the public and perhaps the investors are doing, often on very partial information. You're getting information, you have, you have your filter, and the, the sort of it hits your knowledge base, which is very limited. If we talk about the public, you know, that are now, you know, thinking uh, Trump is great or whatever, I don't want to take a political stand on it. It is a fairly thin, uh, f thin you know, knowledge base that the, this information hits. He understands that that's why he speaks in such simple language. Hillary Clinton tries to explain, you know, how she, how she thinks. It's not going very well for her, uh, except in Boston. Uh, where, where, where they are, they are academics. 
but you know, Boston is not going to select the next president. Uh, so this this is uh, 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 this is uh, what a basic sort of theme about the transparency that I wanted uh, wanted to bring up, and saying that the scandals have really eaten this important role of the board to be this filter and be a represent representative for the purpose of evaluating uh, the, the the leadership uh, is uh, is being being injured severely injured. By, by the scandals, and uh, that's just the way, uh, uh, the way it has to be. So let me say a few words about governance reform, that if you take this perspective that the issue is about this information flow, the flow between CEO and board, between board and, and, and shareholders, and nowadays, you know, the, all of us with the public. If you take that perspective and ask yourself, what would be good reforms that sort of are conducive to having a good information flow, would help the board members to understand what the people are thinking, would help the CEOs to be open about how he or she th is thinking. You know, that's how I'm thinking about the corporate governance issue. Now that's, that's sort of the objective for me. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there are countries where the corporate governance is much in poorer shape and their, their fraud and other things are on the surface, but if we are talking about developing, developing economies, I think this is, this is the... So let me give my favorite good uh, Sarbanes-Oxley reform, which I think is terrific and speaks exactly to this issue. Sarbanes-Oxley had a reform that the board has to meet without executives. And so it was a wonderful idea because you understand that we are sitting there and as Jack Wells put it, if my board ever wants to have a meeting without me, I'm out of here, he said about GE. And of course the newspapers were filled and said, hey, well that's just extreme arrogance and just shows everything of how bad the corporate cover. This is, this is just proof, 100% proof how stupid or how you know, bad. From my perspective, we understand completely what he's saying. He's saying, you know, if you are, if you are, lim I, first of all, you have to understand, a CEO can be out right now. You know, it's all it takes is the board meets and says he's out, he's out. I know severance, or there are severance paper has, but you know, you're out. And, uh, and happens, by the way, in family firms quite a bit that, uh, that uh, uh, I'm speaking about my own family firm. Unfortunately, I think it was bad, but you know, that's what people. In any case, the, the reason it is good is that it takes off this suspicion of the CEO to have to think, why, are they, why, why do they want to be without me? Is there something going on that I don't know? If you mandate it, you can speak without him. And by the way, you need to speak without him because you don't say all the things you want to say when you are when you are with the CEO in the place. So I think that mandatory non-executive meetings is a terrific idea, not just in, in, in this place, but in a lot of other places. Uh, I, want to, uh, I want to speak to a few other, you know, there is a question about, one point, I want, one point about this is this, this being sort of watching whether they are doing something wrong versus trying to evaluate how good they are at their business. You know, it may sound like they are very similar things. They are radically different things. You know, if you are in the mindset of watching whether you are talking to a crook, you aren't, your ears are not open to hearing, you know, how does the person think. So this is, a, this is a sort of, the board has a bad job design from this point of view. You know, you have to be on one hand this, perhaps, and that's why one of them usually you don't even think about, namely the crook part. You are thinking about the other part and they include advisor. So the question is, can you by reforms, you know, change this setup so that it would be more conducive to a, a better sort of board atmosphere? And I think, so, I mentioned the mandatory non-executive, I think, uh, I think I've thought a lot about moving stuff outside to outside experts. So my, the main example that I've used in, uh, uh, is that, you know, maybe, executive compensation should in some way or another be moved. Maybe like auditors who have generally accepted accounting principles, maybe there should be generally accepted remuneration principles. 
somebody who have, uh, not the consultants, because consultants are in the, you know, they are just risk averse and they just follow a crowd. They, are, they, they, they don't have much imagination, you know, and as far as I'm, my, my opinion is they don't have much understanding of executive compensation either. Uh, executive compensation, by the way, which is one of the supposed culprits, it has never been in worse shape in my view than it is today. That is, you know, the days when there was just options and stock, or just stock, I mean, were wonderful days compared to the mess in which we are right now, and, and, and at least where when I left in 2012, the Nokia board. Uh, because uh, nobody understands even what the incentive properties are, nobody can evaluate these schemes, and they are just uh, inconsistent. Uh, let me just give an example of inconsistency, you know. You, can, you cannot write an, if you write an option, it has to be on market value or higher, the exercise price has to be at market or above. If you write it below market price, the option that is you can buy your share for less than the market price is today, that's just, out, you know, that's just thought to be outrageous because you're giving for free money to, you know, the guy. However, uh, shares are okay to give. Now it so happens that shares are options at exercise price zero. So here you have a, 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 a set of rules, implicit or explicit about, you know, I, I, can give, I can use exercise price zero for the option, that's wonderful, in fact that's the favored mode, or at the market price or above, but not between zero and whatever the market price is. I mean, you know, doesn't take very much to think to realize that you know this 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 they haven't thought a lot about that. So I think what we would need perhaps is you know some somebody who thinks through these issues and there's a lot of very good work by the way these days by young people uh, doing uh, interesting work about fairly simple schemes that makes a lot of sense in terms of getting the executive compensation out. Uh, this, I was going to talk, uh, Marco, I have to mention the fact that Marco has studied, you know, how much more maybe the shareholders should be given some of the, maybe, the, maybe it's too arduous to be, re be a representative, maybe I just should have a referendum with the shareholders on various issues, so as to ease the sort of complexity of the board, board tasks. And, uh, and uh, Marco has studied the English law, which is the most, so that has the most extensive rules or restrictions or, or advanced, if you want to say it that way, and found out that when the, when the board, bo when, the, when we are looking at mergers and acquisitions that are in the class one of the UK code, meaning that they are big enough, I just use the, they are precise specifications, then if you, those have to go to, the, to, to a vote among shareholders, and if those votes, if the shareholder says yes, then the thing can proceed. Sometimes it doesn't go through, but it can proceed. If they say no, it doesn't. So this is a very, I, I don't know any other country that uses the probably are other countries, but Marco's research, recent research, I, I don't, you know, shows that this actually makes for, this has a positive effect in the sense that the, the, the acquisition price is lower. And in other words, it's more favorable at least for the, for the party that's buying. So that's an example of, uh, but there are other things also. One of the worries, so let me close by saying that my big worry is that the public court has come into this picture in such a forceful way. The thing that, the reason that it worries me is that the public court is not a normal court. You know, you are not, you are not innocent until proof, proven guilty. You are innocent as accused. Uh, you, are, you are guilty as accused, you know, and you are sort of lynched and hang right there uh, and the, the higher up in the, in the pecking order you are, politician or CEO, you know, it's over as soon as they start talking about it. It's a moral set of rules rather than legal set of rules. Not always bad, but it's a different set. You don't know, you know, morals keep changing. And it is not that if it was okay to do this way when I did it, but not okay anymore today, you know, today's rule will apply. So violations of very basic human civilization principles as to how you deal with people. They get a due hearing and, and so on. And that is a, that's an example uh, where, you know, I don't say that I, you can shut down the transparency, but, uh, you know, 
Uh, I think the response to that is on one hand to be open to this and ac acknowledge it and bring up the four. The other, this is a second place where handing it out to a neutral party, you know, certain decisions can sort of reduce the stress on the, on the actual uh, process. Uh, on the so, sort of, you don't expose yourself as much as a, as a board or a CEO. And so let me uh, close by saying that this is, this is what, uh, what I think this public court or this public sort of approach to information acquisition and uh, what they are served and so on. I think that is something that uh, would be interesting to study. I think that is something that will have to be studied and approaches to that, uh, that, uh, uh, that type of information flow and how it affects you know, the board. The, 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 the sort of uh, the way the board and the CEO and the leadership works. Uh, those are those are both issues of concern and, and issues of interest uh, for for uh, an academic. That's what I would be doing unless I would have to solve the. Financial